So for those of you who have just been joining, we're going to start with the chickpea recipe. So if you want to grab your ingredients for the roasted chickpea recipe and preheat your oven, you can hit, set it to 350 or 375. I tend to kind of cheat it a little higher because I'm impatient and I want them to cook faster. <laughs> so you can put your, rest, your oven on and then get those ingredients for our first recipe ready to go. So we've still got a couple people trickling in here and I am recording this. So if say you have to zip out or you miss something or you know maybe I say something you're like, oh, I wanna remember that. Don't worry, I'm going to send out the recording tomorrow afternoon um, for everyone who signed up for the class. So you'll have this recording that you can come back to over and over and over again as often as you like and you've got your recipe handouts so you can kind of make this your own. I like to offer options, I like to give you a recipe and then you can really tweak it and make it what you like. So when we get into the actual building of the bowl, I'm gonna give you some other suggestions and tips and things that you can throw into it. I like to call them almost fridge salads. You can just throw whatever you've got on hand and make a nice big filling meal. So we still have a couple of people joining, but I am going to get started just so that we can sort of move this along and like I said, not be eating our dinner at 9 p.m. So to begin today, I'm going to give a little introduction of who I am and sort of why I'm doing these classes. And then we're going to dig right into the recipes and I did send out a little email. So you want to have them grouped and we'll go from chickpeas to start. And then we're going to make our rice because that takes the next longest to cook. And after we make our rice, we're going to do our, our dressing, our glory bowl dressing, which is my all time favorite. I eat it with a spoon all the time. Um, and then once we are done with the dressing, we're gonna pull it all together, chop some veggies and make a really delicious Buddha bowl. So thank you so much everybody for joining this evening. I really appreciate you taking the time out of you know the first day of your week, probably a little busy, to come and cook with me and cook with everyone else who joined and learn some new tips and new tricks and some sort of kitchen inspiration. Uh, my name's Caitlin. If we haven't met before, I'm a holistic nutritionist and a culinary nutrition expert as well as a yoga teacher. So I wear many hats. I don't like to get bored. I like to do lots of different things. <laughs> So tonight we're really going to be focusing on the culinary nutrition aspect of what I do. And this is truly, I think, one of the most important parts of those, those habit changes, those things that I mentioned in sort of the pre-chat that we had, where it's a new year, it's 2021, nothing really changes when the calendar shifts to a new year, but when... We come to January, there's often a lot of excitement or motivation or inspiration to take some changes on board. And so that's what we're going to be doing tonight. I want to just share some little tips for inviting healthy habit changes into your life, for carrying them through. So, you know, it's not just something you stick with for two, three, four weeks, and then life gets in the way and you leave it behind. We want to be building habits that last for a lifetime. So tonight we're going to be looking at some kitchen skills that we can learn and we're going to be starting with some roasted chickpeas. So this is one of my favorite, favorite recipes and it's honestly the easiest thing to make and they are so customizable. So we're making sweet and salty chickpeas just because if you notice in the grocery list, I like to use ingredients in more than one way so that your grocery list doesn't end up this long and you're spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars every week. Now there might've been a couple items that you were stocking your pantry with, so it was maybe a little more expensive, but those bottles of vinegars and tamaris and nutritional yeast are gonna last for lots of recipes. So you're kind of investing a little bit now and it's gonna pay off in the long run. So to start our recipe, we want to strain and rinse our chickpeas. As you can see, I already strained and rinsed these bad boys. And it's about one large can. My recipes are very forgiving, so you can really fudge around with the numbers, with the measurements. So kind of whatever you have. One large can, can of chickpeas is great. And then we're going to grab some olive oil 
And the recipe says two teaspoons. The way I tend to measure is I drizzle it over. And when it looks like there's sort of a coating on the chickpeas, that's about two teaspoons. But please feel free to measure. But that's where we're gonna start. So we want to get the chickpeas coated. Give them a little stir now so that every chickpea gets a little bit of oil on it. And this is helpful because it's going to help the nutritional yeast and the coconut palm sugar actually stick to the chickpeas. So we've got our one can of chickpeas here, and then we're going to grab our nutritional yeast. So this is an ingredient I absolutely love to cook with. I put it on basically everything. It's fantastic if you're vegan or vegetarian because it's fortified with B vitamins. So it's a great source of those B vitamins that we tend to get in a lot of animal products that you might not get as much of when you're vegetarian. So it's a deactivated yeast. It's not active in any way. You can't use this to bake bread, nothing like that. And we're using a quarter cup and it's got a nice cheesy taste to it. So it kind of gives that umami, salty cheesiness to any recipe that you cook with. I love using it to coat um, things that I'm going to be roasting because it gives a nice crunch and it gives that really nice salty uh, flavor. But I'm also a big fan of salty sweet. So we're going to add a little bit of coconut palm sugar. And this is a sweetener that I really um, like to use in my cooking in any recipe that calls for a dry sugar. And the reason being is coconut palm sugar has about 50% less of an impact on our blood sugar than a white sugar is going to have. So it's going to be nice and sweet. It has that lovely flavor, but it has half the effect on our blood sugar. And so we're using about a, tea, a tablespoon. You can, you can use a little less, you can use a little more. It really, it's not gonna make a huge difference just to your taste preference. So I love to use these lower glycemic sweeteners. So they're lower glycemic, meaning they have that lower impact on our blood sugar levels because that helps us keep our energy stabilized throughout the day. It helps keep our moods more balanced. It helps stave off cravings. So I know a lot of people, when they come to the new year, they're like, oh, I wanna eat healthy, I wanna do this, I wanna do that. Then they go to work and it's 3 p.m. and they're starving and all there is is a donut in the break room. And they need to eat it because they have that intense craving for energy and for sweetness. And so if we can keep our blood sugar a little more stable, so instead of say eating something like a bagel for breakfast with about 50 grams of sugar per bagel, that's gonna spike our sugar really high up and then it gets digested very quickly because there's not really any protein, there's not really any fat, it's almost pure sugar. So we chew it up, stays in the stomach, not for very long, passes through the small intestine and it basically starts sending out pure sugar into our bloodstream. And the body doesn't really like this because too much sugar in the bloodstream can actually cause um, damage to our cells something called advanced glycation end products. So AGEs, they tend to age us. So what we want to do is keep our blood sugar stable. So when we spike the sugar and then it, it goes too high, we tend to overproduce insulin. So we get a big spike. And then with that overproduction of insulin, it sometimes crashes too low. And that's when we get those hypoglycemic uh, phases. So when our sugar drops really, really low, that's when we start to get those cravings. You might get that hanger where you wanna just go and like punch someone in the face for a cookie, uh, where you can't control it, you need to eat something right, right now. So we get that big spike, overproduction of insulin, big crash, we get a craving, and at the same time, when our blood sugar goes too low, the body panics, and so it wants us to release some of the stored sugar we have in our muscle tissues and our liver, called glycogen, and so it releases a hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is a stress hormone, so it can impact our immune function and it can impact sometimes the deposition of fat around the midsection, because we tend to hold on to it when we're in times of stress. So we're kind of spiking and crashing throughout our day and we get home and we're exhausted. So what we really want to do with this meal and with all of our meals is really stabilize that blood sugar. So let's give a little bit of salt to our chickpeas. We'll just pop these in the oven before I continue blathering away. Give it a little stir, a little mix. And then we're going to grab our baking sheet and spread the chickpeas. So you can see here, they've got a nice little coating on them. We're going to spread them out in a single layer, just like so. 
and then ooh, pop them in the oven. What's that? They're already done. That's amazing. So you're going to pop them in the oven and put a timer on for 20 minutes because you want to stir them every 20 minutes so they get evenly baked and don't burn on the bottom. And what you're looking for, I'll hold them kind of up to the camera here, is a nice crunchy, I don't know if you can hear the, they're nice and crunchy in there and they get nice and dark and quite hard. So I even baked these last night and they're still super, super crunchy. So don't be afraid of pushing the color, getting them a little bit darker than you might think so that they get that nice crispy texture. And they will crisp up a little as you take them out of the oven, but we're looking for a nice crunchy, crispy chickpea. So I'm going to check the questions here, see if we have any for this recipe. It doesn't look like it. Um, so I'll just finish up very briefly my blood sugar little chat. So where we kind of ended was that big crash and the release of cortisol, the cravings for sugar. And if we're doing that all day, every day, we can feel really out of control of what we're eating. Um, you can do, Sam, you can do 350 or 375. My oven tends to run quite cool, so I tend to bump it up. I'm also impatient, so I'll bump it up too if I want it to cook quicker. But if you're someone who tends to forget about stuff in the oven, 350 is your best bet because then there's less chance it will burn. So kind of anywhere in between 350 to 375, depending. Um, so they'll last, the chickpeas will last mm, about a week or so if you store them in an airtight container. But the crucial piece is to let them cool fully before you put them away. So I'll let them cool for a couple of hours and stir them on the baking sheet before I store them because otherwise they, get, they can get quite soft. But if that does happen, all you do is pop them in the oven for another few minutes and they'll crisp back up again. So any other questions for the chickpeas? All right, I'm just going to slide these down to the side here. Keep this for our dressing. Maple sugar uh, is totally fine, Rhiannon. That's going to be, as long as it's um, a granulated sugar and not like a wet sugar. So we don't want to use like maple syrup or something like that, but you could use date sugar, coconut palm sugar, maple sugar. Um, if you have an organic uh, white sugar, that'll work as well. We just want something to get that little crunchy sweetness, but keeping um, the glycemic level low. And the way that we do that is by combining healthy fat, healthy protein, and healthy fiber. So when we were just talking before, we're eating sort of pure sugar and spiking and crashing. So when we're eating things with a high glycemic index or glycemic load, we can overwhelm our system. And everyone is going to react slightly differently. So some people will have more tolerance for sweeter or more carb-rich meals than others. So you kind of have to figure out your, your threshold and what works best for you but a really easy rule of thumb to keep your blood sugar stable is to combine at least two of the three macronutrients in every meal and snack. So that would be a fat, a protein, and a carbohydrate, complex carbohydrate. So in our chickpeas, they're fantastic because they have all three. So the chickpea is a great source of fiber, complex carbs, and some protein, some plant-based protein. The nutritional yeast has a good protein source as well. We've got healthy fat from our olive oil. And so we're creating something that is going to take not only longer to break down in the stomach, so we physiologically stay fuller longer, but instead of when it leaves the belly, only releasing carbohydrate or glucose into the bloodstream, we're releasing all the macronutrients. So instead of getting a big spike, we're sort of getting a nice gentle peak and then a slow decline. And that's where we get that stable mood and that stable um, craving, not cravings, those stable appetite. So that's what we're going to do with this whole meal. Next up, we're going to make our turmeric rice. So we want to grab our coconut milk. We want to grab our rice. So I'm using a jasmine rice. You can use a basmati. You could use a long grain brown rice, sort of whatever is your preference and just adjust the cooking time to that rice. It does work best with basmati and jasmine, but 
I always say the best ingredient is the one you have in your pantry, so go for that. And we're going to use some turmeric, my big epic sized jar of turmeric, some coconut milk, and a little tiny bit of apple cider vinegar. So, first thing we wanna do is measure out our rice. So the recipe in the handout, the first handout I sent out had a little typo in it. I forgot to put the water measurement. I did update the handout that I sent out at 5 p.m. and it does have the water. Uh, so you can download that one to get the proper measurements, but we'll go over it here anyway. So for the coconut rice, which is one of my favorites, we're gonna use one cup of rice. So you'll kinda wanna measure that and be nice and messy, just like me. Pop that right into your pot. And then we're going to add one cup of water. So most rices cook at about a two to one ratio of wet to dry. So one cup of rice to two cups of liquid. So we're gonna use one cup of water and then we're going to use one cup of coconut milk. So we're doing a 50-50 ratio water to coconut milk. I've done it with full coconut milk and it does get just a little bit rich, I find. So I like to cut it with half water, but you can make the ratio whatever floats your boat. So opening your can, and I love this coconut milk. You can get it at Costco in a six pack for $9.99 and it's organic and the cans are BPA free, which is great, especially for women as BPA can be a known endocrine disruptor. So it can be bad for women's hormones. So this is called Cha's Organic Coconut Milk and you get a nice six pack for $9.99. I'm not sponsored by Costco. I just really, really like them. <laughs> so we're gonna add in our one cup of coconut milk. And then I do just a little splash of apple cider vinegar. You can use rice vinegar um, if that's what you have. And yes, Kathy, keep an eye out. Costco is honestly one of the best places to find organic or natural or really great um, ingredients and foods. So just keep an eye out. It's usually with um, like where the tamari and all the spices are. It's usually in that aisle there on the bottom shelf, at least the one in St. John. Might be a little different depending on where you are. So we only need a tiny little splash of the apple cider vinegar. I just like it because when you're cooking, it's all about layering flavors and it's all about adding in different texture or different uh, flavor profiles. So we wanna add that little tiny bit of acidity in order to cut the richness of the coconut's oil. So the water is one cup, Rhiannon. So there's one cup water, one cup coconut oil, or co coconut oil, that'd be a lot, coconut milk, and then, um, just a little bit of apple cider vinegar, like literally just a little splash. And then we always want to season. So a lot of people don't season their rice and this is a very big mistake because like I said, we're layering flavors throughout the entire meal. And so we want to add, I think mine evaporated. We want to add some salt so that it's really brightening up the flavor of even the rice. So even this thing that's often just like a throwaway in a meal, we don't give it much love or attention, we're gonna give our rice a little bit of love tonight. So a little bit of salt, and then we want one teaspoon of turmeric powder. And again, you can find this basically everywhere. My friend gave me this gigantic jar because she knows I'm a big food nerd, and she knows I love jars. So. Turmeric, you can find at Costco, health food stores. Um, I do like the powder more than the root just because it's easier to work with and tends to be a little less messy. So we'll add that in. And lastly, our last little ingredient to jazz things up is just a little bit of coconut oil. So again, not too much, about a teaspoon. And we'll just pop that right in. Give everything a stir. So you wanna mix it all together. And then from here, we just pop our lid on. And I've got to turn on my induction burner from behind. Oh, sorry for that. 
turn that on and I'll turn it down a little bit. So you, what we want to do is bring our rice to a boil. Do not take the lid off and then we're gonna let it just kind of bubble away, let it simmer. So one of the reasons we're using coconut in our rice is because when you cook rice, it can be quite a dense source of carbohydrates. Some people, that's fine, I'm quite carb sensitive, so I tend to need to find ways to make sure that my blood sugar stays balanced, that I don't get um, big spikes and crashes. I have a history of PCOS, so I have some insulin uh, balance issues. And one of the beautiful things about adding coconut oil or coconut milk to our rice is that once you cook it and then cool it down, it creates um, a specific type of fiber in the rice, uh, and which, will, which is indigestible. So it's, it's undigestible fiber. And so it keeps the blood sugar balance lower and also feeds our yummy or our friendly gut bacteria. Uh, Eileen, yes, you can use a rice cooker just use your, your rice cooking settings. So whatever sort of your regular rice cooking settings would be, this recipe is gonna work fine with that. So that's why we're adding our coconut to our rice. Again, we're looking for that blood sugar balance. So this is having our carbohydrates and then healthy fats to help keep things nice and balanced, specifically from coconut. So any questions about the rice before we move on to our next recipe? I'll give you a second just to kind of get it on the stove. Smells so good. Yeah, it does, Kathy. That's cooking in my kitchen. Always smells really tasty. I'm all about let's, how much flavor can we pack into what we're making? If we're eating something, if we're eating healthy, if it doesn't taste good, what's the point? You're not gonna stick with it if you're not enjoying every meal, every, every mouthful, if it isn't something that you actually look forward to eating, you're not gonna end up sticking with any resolutions to bring in healthier ways of eating to your lifestyle because it's not sustainable to be eating something that makes you miserable day in, day out until you die. <laughs> so that's why we bring in as much flavor. Salt is your best friend. I use a Himalayan pink sea salt. Um, guess where I got that? Oh, surprise, surprise. I got it at Costco. <laughs> and it just adds a really nice, it, what it does is it actually opens up the taste buds in your tongue. So that's how things like salt and vinegars and acids actually work, is they open the taste buds on your tongue so more flavor can get in. So they kind of irritate them a little bit. So they open up and then more flavor gets in and that's how you get food to taste really, really good. But we want to be using high quality salts. So when you use a lot of table salt or iodized salt, it actually has sugar in it, which seems odd, but it's to help it keep it from caking. It has anti-flowing agent or it has flowing agents in it. It has a lot of preservatives in addition to, I'm just going to pop that down, in addition to the salt. So you're not just getting salt, you're getting all these other things in the package. So if we want to use sort of a sea salt, or the Himalayan pink salt, whichever is your, your preference, that is going to um, be a better option long-term. Like, I'm not saying be terrified of table salt. You're gonna have it when you're at restaurants, that's life. But at home, just choosing another option. And then a way to get more iodine is cooking with sea vegetables, which is a topic for another class. But I like to just, even if I make a soup, throw a little piece of seaweed in there to leach out the iodine. All right. So let's move on to our next recipe. Let's pop these down on the floor. We're going to do the glory bowl dressing next. So if you want to grab your ingredients for the glory bowl dressing, we'll move on to that one. All right. And I got really fancy and I measured everything out in advance and put it all on a pretty little board. So we're gonna be using a couple different ingredients here and making what is one of my all time favorite recipes. Oh, looks like someone might have. Okay, so 
Uh, tamari and soy sauce are not actually the exact same thing. They are both made from soybeans, but the fermentation process to actually get the liquid is different. So for tamari, generally high quality tamari is the runoff that you get when you make miso. So it uses a different um, bacterial bacteria and different enzymes to get the tamari. And then soy sauce can often have um, other things included in it. So you might get soy sauce with some wheat or um, other additives, but they can be used pretty well interchangeably. I do like to use organic as much as possible just because soy is one of a very highly sprayed product um, that grows. So when we're eating tons and tons of soy, we want to make sure it's organic so that we're not getting in a huge, huge pesticide load. To make your dressing, you're going to want a, oh, tamari soy sauce. That's probably just a name. Um, so because it is made with soy sauce, but like I said, one that just says soy sauce is going to be just marginally different in terms of the bacteria used to ferment it. And sometimes the ingredient list is gonna change a little bit there. But flavor wise, they are very, very similar. I find tamari can even be slightly saltier than soy sauce. So you can be, what you might wanna do is, is test it out, make sure you're not over using too much and over salting. Or if you have soy sauce, you might use a slight bit extra. Okay, so to begin, we're going to be making our glory bowl dressing. And this is one of my all time favorite dressing recipes. I eat it with a spoon. I make it all the time. I put it on everything. It's fantastic as not only a dressing for like salad bowls and things like that, or it's great with raw veggie sticks. It's great for if you make um, like chicken skewers or you can do like rice wraps and things like that. This dressing basically works with whatever you got going on. <laughs> and we're going to be using tamari or soy sauce, some rice vinegar, some apple cider vinegar. We've got our delicious nutritional yeast. We've got some garlic, a little bit of tahini, which is one of my favorites, and some maple syrup for a sweetener, and a little bit of water, because I find things that are made with tahini tend to thicken up quite a bit. So we'll begin with our, um, our salad dressing. And most dressings are basically an acid and an oil combined together. And then you can get really creative and emulsify them with something like a tahini or a mustard. You can add in flavorings like your garlic, your nutritional yeast. You can sweeten them. You can really make your dressing whatever you want it to be as long as you have some sort of acid, which would be a vinegar, a citrus, something along those lines, a healthy fat. So we're gonna use olive oil, but you could use um, an MCT oil, avocado oil, hemp, whatever, the, whatever you prefer and a little bit of garlic, because garlic makes things, everything better. First ingredient we're gonna use, a third of a cup of your tamari. So you're just gonna pour that right into a bowl. We've got a third of a cup of apple cider vinegar. And apple cider vinegar is one of my favorite vinegars to use. Um, it's generally unpasteurized, so you do want to look for an unpasteurized version. And when it's unpasteurized, it's going to be a nice source of what are called probiotic bacteria. And these are bacteria that are beneficial for our digestive system and can help support immune function as well. I have a whole other class on probiotics and fermentation, but that's a very, 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 very brief summary of probiotics. Um, we do want to be getting them not just from supplements, so a lot of people supplement with probiotics, but it's great to get them from food because we get lots of different strains and they all colonize the digestive tract a little differently and function a little differently in the body. The information that we're getting on probiotics is just coming out constantly. And so we're always learning and there's lots we don't know. Um, but in general, eating a food safe fermented uh, probiotic food is a great little addition to the diet. Uh, we don't want to cook probiotics because that can kill them, so it's great we're using it in our raw dressing. Next is some rice vinegar. So this can be any type of rice vinegar that you like. And this one we're only using a quarter cup. So instead of a third of a cup, we're using a quarter cup of the rice vinegar. And next up, we're going to add a third of a cup of water. So I'm just adding 
some water. Again, it helps keep the sauce from kind of getting super thick and gloopy. For sweetener, I'm using maple syrup. You can use any sort of liquid sweetener that you like. So if you, have, if you prefer honey, if you prefer a palm syrup, whatever sort of your liquid sweetener of choice is, I'm a huge fan of maple syrup. We get tons of it in Canada. It's affordable, it's delicious, it adds a nice flavor to anything that you're cooking. And we're balancing out all that saltiness with a little bit of sweetness. And we're using a quarter cup of the maple syrup, which seems like a lot, but don't forget that this is a dressing that you're gonna be having, you know, a couple tablespoons of, and we've got all these other ingredients in there. So per serving, the amount of sugar is actually quite, quite low. We'll give that a quick little stir together. And then next we'll pour in our tahini. So tahini is um, a seed butter, essentially, that I really love to work with. It comes from sesame seeds. So it's basically a sesame paste. Um, it's used in a lot of Middle Eastern cuisine. It has a really rich, nutty flavor. It is lower in allergen than like a peanut or even a, a tree nut butter. And it's a really high food source of calcium. So it's one of the higher food sources of calcium that is out there, which is great. Again, if you're, maybe one of your goals for the year is to eat more plants and to be more plant-based in the way that you're eating, which is fabulous but we always want to make sure that we're doing it correctly. So we wanna make sure we're still getting those nutrients that we might've been getting from other sources. So if say you're, I'm not gonna do dairy anymore, tahini is going to be a great addition to your diet to help you get that nice plant source of calcium. So we'll put that right in there and wipe the fingers off. Next up, we've got our nutritional yeast and we're using one half cup plus two tablespoons, which I know seems like a super weird measurement, but trust me, I tasted it with only half a cup and it just really wasn't as good. So add the extra two tablespoons to make sure that you get that nice, rich umami flavor. So again, as I mentioned, our nutritional yeast is a great source of protein, uh, plant-based protein. It's got our B vitamins. It's uh, really cheesy and delicious and adds that salty umami flavor to the foods that we're eating. So I'll just pop these down. Getting stuff out of the way here. Okay, so now I want to show you just a quick little demo on how to cut garlic. Because this is something that I see in my cooking classes all the time that people struggle with. And it's no wonder people hate cooking if they spend 10 minutes trying to get garlic out of its little papery outfit. So we're gonna do a little demo, holding it up here. So the garlic has a flat top and then kind of a little tail bottom. So we want to put the flat part towards our knife. So we've got our hand, curl the fingers in, take your knife, and when we're using knives, we want to stabilize the blade, put your thumb on the knife, your finger on the other side. And so that's gonna hold the blade stable rather than just holding the handle, which, doesn't give us much control. When we hold onto the blade like this, we have much more control, way less likely to slice a little finger off or get those kitchen injuries. So holding onto the blade, three fingers around the handle, thumb and pointer finger, loosely or tightly grasping that blade, flat part of the garlic, cut the little hat off. So that's his little hat, the little flat part. And I hope you grabbed your scrap bowl to throw all your bits in. And then once the little hat is off, flat side of the knife, sharp part facing away. So you don't want the sharp part facing you, facing away. Take the palm of your hand and press down. Now, if you're on a counter, you can smash down. I'm on a table and I don't want it to break. So I just kind of lightly pressed, but feel free to smash it down. And then the rest of the skin comes right off. And since we're going to be blending this, we don't really need to chop this in any sort of fancy way. We're just gonna cut it into a couple smaller pieces. So you can see there, nothing, nothing too, too fancy. And we're using three full cloves. So I already cut my other two cloves, just again, so that we're not here all night long. And we've got all of our base ingredients now into our dressing.
So give that a quick little stir. And this is where if you have, oh, that's done. If you have a, an immersion blender, you're going to use your immersion blender. If you have a food processor, you can use a food processor. If you have a regular blender, you can use a regular blender on a very low speed. I'm going to be using my immersion blender, which is one of my all time favorite kitchen gadgets. You can get these pretty well anywhere. I used my points at Superstore to get mine and it was on sale. So these are fantastic for making salad dressings. So you can get a really nice creamy emulsified dressing. They're fantastic for pureeing soups rather than taking your soup off the stove, letting it cool, putting it in a blender, buzzing it up, putting it back in the pot. Way too much work. A little handheld immersion blender is going to be a game changer. So what we're going to do here before we add our oil, so this is with any salad dressing that you make. If you want it to emulsify and get really creamy, you want to put all the base ingredients except the oil together, and then we're going to give that a little buzz. And I apologize in advance for the noise here. So basically what you want is for the garlic to get broken down. So kind of take a look if you see chunks of garlic. So I see a big one right here. You want to give it another quick little buzz together. <laughs> Sam, um, yes, it might take a little bit uh, for your, if you already added the oil, it might take a little bit longer. You should still be able to blend it, like uh, emulsify it all together. If you can't, grab a mustard and just put a little squeeze of mustard in there and that should help emulsify the oil and the vinegar together. All right. So now that's all buzzed. We're going to, this is, this is not something I ever recommend anyone do. When you're not in use, take this off because otherwise it'll fall and your stuff will go everywhere. I've done it, trust me, learn from my mistakes. <laughs> We're going to open up our olive oil or you know, if you have an avocado or a different oil. Um, we're gonna open it up, and this is basically how we make mustard, or mustard, mayonnaise as well, is that emulsification process of the oil, nice and slow and steady. All right, so let's get this going, and I'm gonna put it on low this time, and then just pour your oil. I forgot to mention we're using about a cup of oil, so measure out a cup of oil and just pour it in a nice thin stream. I've cooked, made this thousands and thousands of times so I can kind of know it by sight. So use your one cup and let it pour in nice and slow. And once you're done emulsifying in the oil, you can take your immersion blender out or it's one cup of oil test. So we're using one cup of oil for the recipe. So of your olive avocado, whatever your preference is, one cup. And I recommend pouring it from a little measuring cup um, or eyeballing it and you can just taste as well. I'm a big fan of just taste everything as you go. If it tastes good, you're on the right track. A little trick with um, salad dressings is you want to taste them when they're done. So I made these recipes, so they're great for my taste buds, for what I like, the flavor profiles that I really enjoy. You might enjoy something that's a little more tangy or a little sweeter or has a little bit more of a luscious uh, like olive oil flavor to it. Easy peasy. All you do, you might add a little extra um, rice vinegar or apple cider vinegar if you want more tang. If you want the flavor is a little more mellow. So if you find the flavors are a little too intense, just add some extra olive oil and a little bit of extra water. If you find, oh, it's not quite the balance of sweet, salty that I enjoy, 
add a little extra splash of your maple. So you can really test and tweak and kind of go at your, go with your taste buds and what you prefer. And then you'll get the, something that you want to eat, that you want to enjoy, and you're going to go back to and actually look forward to eating. So that's our glory bowl. And you can pop that in the fridge if you'd like to just kind of set and chill while we're chopping some of our veggies. If you do want, if you find, oh, it doesn't have quite enough flavor, just add a little pinch of sea salt and stir it in. I didn't put salt in the recipe, I don't think, because tamari is quite salty. But if you do want that little bit of extra, just sprinkle in a little bit and there you go. So we've got a nice dressing and it does thicken in the fridge. So if you find that tomorrow you go to take it out of the fridge and it's quite thick, stir in a little bit of water and it's perfect. I'm gonna pop that into my fridge. And does anyone have any questions about that recipe before we move on? How long can you store in the fridge? Thank you for asking Justine because I meant to mention this dressing uh, keeps in the fridge about seven to nine days, but it freezes spectacularly well. What you can do is grab a, an ice cube tray, pour some dressing into the ice cube tray, pop it in the freezer, let it all freeze. And then when it's frozen, you just pop it out of the tray, put it in little Ziploc baggies or containers and keep them in your freezer. And then if you've made, say, a batch of uh, Buddha bowls or salad bowls or whatever for your week, you can take out one little ice cube or two if you're like me and food isn't merely a vehicle for sauce. You can grab two ice cubes, put them on your salad. If you're going to work, they should be melted by lunchtime and you can stir them in without making your salad go really um, soggy and kind of sad and pathetic. So they freeze really, really well. The ice cube trick is fantastic. And if you do that with, you know, two or three dressings over a couple of weeks, you have lots of different flavors for the mood that you're in. So you can look and be like, oh, I'm more in a mood for like a creamy balsamic. And oh, I made one two weeks ago. I'll grab a couple of those. Or maybe you're in the mood for, I have one that's an avocado lime uh, ginger, which is a really great one to bring a little bit of like freshness to the really cold and dreary winter. So you can play around and make a few different dressings so that your meals are always exciting. So even if say you're boring like me and you have Brussels sprouts almost every single day, you can put a different sauce on them so that they do taste different when you're eating them. Um, I made a little chimichurri, which I'd never done the other day and I've been using that in like tacos and it really just jazzes things up. So when in doubt, make a delicious sauce and bring some excitement to the food that you're making. Oh, you're welcome, Anne. That is a, it's, a good, it's a good trick, it works. So I'm just going to clear off this stuff and we're going to scoot right along. We're doing great, everybody, good timing. We're just going to finish up now with our, um, the chopping. So we're just gonna chop some veggies. Make sure you clear off your counter space. You wanna just have a little clear space to work in. You want to make sure your knife is really sharp. So a sharp knife is your best friend in the kitchen. It helps to prevent um, injuries and a dull knife hurts way more to cut yourself with than a sharp knife does. So look for little sharpeners. I get mine at Superstore. I got just, it's just a little guy. He's like this big. I'm not a fancy chef. I don't need um, your dress. So Rhiannon, is it separated or is it just, um, like still, because mine's not super thick. It's just emulsified together. Like it's still, it's still quite runny. So is it um, that it won't thicken or is it that it won't emulsify? Like is everything still separated? Because it does still have some runniness to it and then it thickens up in the fridge once you put it in the fridge. Looks like yours, perfect. I knew you had this, you're good. Um, all right my last couple ingredients here. My very fancy kitchen setup <laughs> in my yoga studio. So just set these aside. And we're going to do just a little bit of veggie prep here. 
So I put specific veggies into the recipe. You can put whatever you freaking want in here. So if you don't like red peppers, leave them out, put something else in. If you wanna bring some roasted sweet potato or roasted broccoli or add in Brussels sprouts or snap peas or edamame, you can bring in whatever you have in your kitchen. I just found these are often ones people generally have on hand and aren't super hard to find. So that's why I included these. They're also easy. It doesn't involve roasting and baking a ton of other stuff. So that's why I chose these veggies. But again, go with what you have on hand or what you really enjoy and are going to eat and be excited about. The first thing we're going to chop, so I'll give a little demo, is our red pepper. I, this must be the smallest red pepper in the history of red peppers. I have very tiny hands and it's barely bigger than that. This is a pro tip. You do not need to cut your peppers down like this, scoop out all the guts, try to pick out all the seeds. We don't need to do that. We take our pepper. This is, I learned this at my very first job. There are no useless jobs. I worked at Subway. We cut the top off. We pull the little hat out, so the green hat, throw that away. See the inside, just stick your hand right in, pull out the seeds, tap it against your hand, and all clean inside. Then we cut it in half, and then you can cut it in two quarters. And we're going to slice little strips. And you might enjoy leaving your pepper as strips for your salad. I'm a big fan of every single bite having a little bit of everything in it. So I will cut the strips and then line them up and curl your fingers in whenever you're holding a veggie. It's a lot better to cut the top of your knuckle than it is to slice the end of your nail. So curl those little fingies in and then chop down. And again, we're not at a restaurant. It doesn't need to be perfect. Just roughly the same size is what we're looking for. So that every bite that we take gets a little flavor explosion from all the delicious veggies we're bringing in. You can see here, they're little cubes. And you can do that with your whole red pepper. And don't throw this guy away. So the little hat that we cut off, again, I just cut that into half and might cut it into half again. Curl those fingies in, slice, and slice this way. And we have those nice, beautiful little cubes with no waste. So cooking healthy, a lot of people, it can be more expensive to, to start with, especially if you're building a pantry, if you need to buy different oils and vinegars and things like that. I always say, buy one thing at a time. You know, when you run out of something that you're maybe not going to be eating anymore, when that runs out, that's when you replace it with something that you want to bring in that might be a little more health promoting. So say you'd been cooking with a lot of uh, canola oil and you wanna sub it out for olive oil because canola has a really high omega-6 content, which can increase inflammation. Again, that's another class I have. I could talk about that <laughs> all day long, but you don't necessarily need to just chuck it all away. If your budget is somewhat smaller for your groceries during the week, just wait till that runs out and then replace it with your olive oil. A few more days of using your canola oil isn't going to make or break your health for the rest of your life. We don't need to panic. We don't need to clear everything out and then spend five, six, seven hundred dollars pulling it all back in. We can, we can take our time and build our pantry as we go along. And again, we're looking for sustainable, healthy changes to make over time so that you stick with it and so that you don't break the bank. That is our red pepper and my little spiel. I'm going to layer a little bit onto my little plate. I didn't cut the whole thing because I mean, you guys don't really need to see me cut a red pepper for 10 minutes. Not that it would take 10 minutes, but there we go. So next we'll do our cucumber and our cucumber, people coming in. All right, so I use just 
half a, an English cucumber. And I'll show you how I like to cut them again so we get that little bit of flavor and texture with every bite. Cut one of the round ends off, throw it in your scrap bowl, and then I'll just slide these out of the way so you can see. Cut that in half, turn them on their sides so they're standing up like little friends, um, and then slice down twice, just like that. So we now have three little pieces. And once that's done, lay them flat and then run your knife this way. So now we have sticks, little cucumber sticks. So these are great for dips um, if you wanna have a hummus or something like that. But for our salad, let's then cut them into little small cubes. So there we go mostly uniform. If you don't like the gooey seed part, it makes it easy to kind of pull them out and chuck them in your bowl. My uncle won't eat anything with cucumber, even if it was just on the plate, because he says the whole smell of it taints everything. So if you don't like that gooey seedy part, you can take that right out and we'll pop that onto the plate as well. And Yuna, tahini. Yes, tahini, I do keep it refrigerated once it's been opened. All my nut and seed butters I refrigerate once they're open just because they are higher in those polyunsaturated fats. So our omega-3s and our omega-6 fats. And those are less stable to heat, light, and air. So that means they can go rancid more quickly than something like an olive oil, a coconut oil, uh, or an avocado oil. So we want to keep those in the fridge so it prolongs the life and it prolongs the flavor. It makes them taste better when they're kept in the fridge because they stay fresher longer. And your taste buds will tell you if they've gone off. It is not pleasant. <laughs> so we've got red pepper, some cucumber. Next up, we'll do our carrot. And I'm not a fan of big chunk, crunchy chunks of carrot. Some people really love that. If you do, I'll show you how to do that. If you're me, we like to grade them. So we cut the nose off, the little pointy bit at the end. And then we grab our cheese grater and grate away. Move that to the plate. Now, if you do enjoy carrot chunks, you should just leave right now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Instead, we will cut a chunk of carrot. So, I mean, you can cut it a little bigger than this. That's just the piece that I had. Just like the cucumber, we stand it up on the flat edge because it's really hard to cut something that's round and rolling around. That's when we get injuries. Flat edge down. Cut and cut. And then depending on how big they are, you can cut them in half and make little coins. If you want bit even bigger pieces, so half moons, you can just cut that and then you can have little half moon pieces. Or if you want them cubed like the cucumber and the red pepper, you cut three times or two times down and then make those little cubes. So lots of ways to enjoy your carrot. So we've got quarter moons, we've got half moons, and we've got little cubes. And they do have fancy knife cut terms, but I don't think we really need to get into that because knowing the term doesn't make them really taste any different. So you can look it up if you want. Next is our red cabbage. And if you don't have red cabbage, no problem. Use your spinaches, use your baby kales, you can cut up big kale. Whatever green you have is going to work great. I like the cabbage because it's pretty, because it's purple and it makes the bowl look really special. But like I said, the best veggie is the veggie you have in your fridge. So we're just looking for something leafy to give a little substance to the uh, Buddha bowl. 
So I cut my cabbage into a quarter. So basically took a cabbage, cut it in half, and then cut it in half again. And all we do, so the core end is where my hand is going to be. And then the top is here. And we just sort of slice thinly down. And the thinner they are, sort of the easier they'll be to chew. If you find that cabbage gives you tummy pains or you don't like raw cabbage, some great options would be, you could take this quarter of cabbage, slather it in olive oil and sea salt, roast it up in the oven at you know, 400 for 10, 15 minutes, get it a little crispy and then cut it. You can also massage some olive oil and lime juice into it with a little bit of sea salt. That's gonna help start breaking down those fibers in the cabbage so that they're easier to chew. Um, you can also just sub it out for something that uh, tastes better to you or is easier for you to digest. So we don't need to be making something that's going to give us indigestion, that's going to make our stomach hurt. A lot of people have an idea that, oh, if I wanna eat healthy, I have to make sure I eat X, Y, Z. You don't have to make sure that you eat anything if that something is making your stomach hurt. I can guarantee you that if you're looking for a specific health benefit from a food, you can Google that food, that benefit. So say you want, uh, for, so cabbage, great source of vitamin C, great source of something called sulforaphane. So people are like, oh, I wanna eat my cabbage to get the sulforaphane to support my liver. You know what else has it? Broccoli, great source of both vitamin C and sulforaphane. If you're looking for vitamin C, have some red peppers. If you want that sort of uh, sulfur uh, compound, any brassica will do. So not just cabbage, that could be broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, kohlrabi, um, mustard greens. Uh, there's a couple other ones that are slipping my mind. Oh, turnips, oh, right? Turnips have the same similar health benefits as your kales and your broccolis, but we forget about them just because they're a humble little root veggie. So don't, the moral of this story is don't eat something that you hate because you think you have to, to get a specific benefit from it. Google is your best friend. Looking up things with omega-3s, everyone wants omega-3s. I have to get it from, from fish. I have to make sure I have fish every day or I have to make sure I have hemp hearts. You don't have to. There's lots of other foods. They may not have quite as high an amount, but you can get a really nice broad spectrum of nutrients if we have a nice varied diet. So don't panic, don't eat things you hate because you think you have to go to the internet and find the thing that you know you'll love and eat that instead. And you might also think you hate a veggie because you've only had it prepared in a really gross way. So another little tip is if you think you hate something, Google some recipes and try it two or three different ways. And if you still hate it, cut it off your list, but you might find a way that you really enjoy it. So that's another option to sort of expand your palate and try some new things at the same time. But always knowing that it doesn't matter if you don't like it in the end, you tried, that's what matters. That's my little spiel. <laughs> so next we've got our avocado. And I do recommend doing this with a butter knife if you have one, because um, I know a lot of people end up in the ER with avocado cuts in their palms. So you can grab a butter knife if you have a nice ripe avocado. If you are using your kitchen knife, be very careful and go very, very slowly. <laughs> You're welcome, Katrina. Thanks so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your evening. So we're going to take our knife, nose end or pointer end, push it in and you'll feel the pit. So you want to find the pit and then very, very slowly, if you're using your kitchen knife, start to roll the knife around the pit until you meet back up with that spot, turn, and there we go. Open it up. This one, eh, it's almost perfect, not quite. And then next step is to take your knife, start to run it down the avocado lengthwise. So you start at the top and run to the bottom. Again, slow and steady, no rush here. And from there, run it widthwise across the avocado. This is going to give us that beautiful little cube shape. 
So a lot of Buddha bowls on Instagram have all these beautiful veggies cut up and they look so lovely, but they're in huge chunks. And I'm not really a fan of eating things that I then have to cut everything up. So if we just cut these little cubes, then we get that one bite, one avocado, one red pepper, et cetera, et cetera, and get to enjoy everything. So you can see here, we've got beautiful little cubes of avocado. And finally, we're getting to our herbs. And I did go to the grocery store three to try to find cilantro and I couldn't find it, which for me is actually a shame because I do love cilantro. But for the purposes of tonight, I grabbed parsley just to show you my herb trick. And I'm still gonna use green onion and mint. Things like cilantro, those leafy green herbs that you know come in a big bunch and you tend to need only a small amount for your recipe and then the rest turns to a gross brown liquid in your vegetable crisper. This is the way to save those veggies. So we're going to, when we get home, we take our beautiful bouquet of parsley or cilantro or whatever it may be and you trim the end just like you would trim flowers when you get flowers home from the florist. You trim the end and then you fill a little jar with water and put them in just like pretty little flowers. And then to keep them really crisp and fresh, we put a little plastic bag over the top and that helps the greens last longer. So this works great for parsley, cilantro, fantastic with kale. So if you go to the grocery store and kale that looks all droopy and sad is on sale, as long as it's not really brown and gross, grab it because you can take it home, trim the ends, put it in water under a plastic bag, stick it in the fridge and it will perk right back up and be fresh and beautiful in less than an hour. I did it yesterday. So that's a little herb saving trick. And what we're going to do with our green onions, just cut them whatever size you like. So trim the ends off and throw them in your little scrap bowl and cut down. We curl those fingers in and we tend to try to keep the point of our knife on the cutting board and work our way down. We keep more control that way. And don't throw away the white part of your green onion. I see that happen all the time and that is where the flavor lives. That is where we get the most flavor, most bang for our buck with our green onion. So cut all the way down to the end. And if you don't like the big rounds, just give an extra little chop like this. So you grab palm of your hand, top of your knife, other hand on the handle and cut this way. There we have our beautiful green onions. And finally, I got the cilantro stir and paste. Uh, so it's just for your, your flavor. So it's, you can add it into your bowl, put a little squeeze in, stir it up, taste it. If you want more, squeeze in a little bit more. Um, it's one of those things when I make a salad, adding in herbs really pumps up the flavor and often pumps up the nutrient density as well. Herbs are often very rich in phytonutrients. Um, they have tons of great flavor. A lot of them can have anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, mint is incredible for digestion. I put it in almost everything that I eat. Uh, it's one of my all-time favorites. It is a really surprising hit of fresh sweetness to a meal when you add a little bit of fresh mint. So I bundle all my leaves together. I kind of squish them all together and roll them a little bit. And then you just take your knife and you gently slice your way down. All the way to the end and then you have beautiful little chiffonade of mint and you don't want to do that other knife trick on mint because it bruises really easily so we just want to do that very light um, uh, cut same if you have any basil you want to do that light little roll it up slice it down and again this is an opportunity to play around what herbs do you like cut those up and throw them in we've got all of our veggies ready to go here. And now we can start to assemble our bowl. 
So open up your rice. It should be done by now. Give it a little bit of a stir. So mine is a beautiful bright orange, orange, no, bright yellow, beautiful bright yellow. It's cooked through. It's a little sticky because I used a jasmine rice. That was just my own personal preference. And we're going to grab our measuring cup. I mean, you don't have to, but sometimes just if you're serving up to people, using your measuring cup can be really helpful. We're going to start to serve. This was, I probably could have grabbed a smaller bowl, but I just like this one. I like to eat out of a nice big bowl when I make like a salad or something. So you can really get in there and stir it all around and you're not spilling stuff everywhere. So don't be shy, get a one size up bowl than you think you'll need. We're going to get about a, cup, a half cup of rice. If you want more, take more. It's your meal, take as much as you want. And put that right in the middle. And I'm gonna stain my white table with turmeric as we always do. And then we can start to layer the veggies around the sides. So putting in as much as you like. Maybe you like one thing more than another, so you can add a little extra of that. And what next? I'll do some green onion and some avocado. So we've got, look at that beautiful rainbow already. Got our beautiful rainbow there. And then you can add some crunchy chickpeas to the top. If you have sesame seeds, throw some sesame seeds in as well. It tastes great. So sprinkle in some of that. And then we're just going to add as much or as little, oh, almost swore, sorry. Almost spilt my dressing. <laughs> Pour your dressing over the top. I'm gonna hold off on putting mine in just at the moment because I'm not gonna eat till after I clean up. But you can just drizzle your dressing right in and you have your beautiful Buddha bowl. And like I mentioned, fully customizable with whatever veggies you have on hand, whatever veggies you enjoy. You could use a quinoa for a base instead of a rice if you'd like. There's no rules here. You can use a different dressing. I have a really lovely maple miso dressing that tastes fantastic with this. So you can play around and make it your own and create this meal that is going to keep your blood sugar nice and stable. So we've got our protein. So we've got some protein in the chickpeas. We've got some protein in the dressing from the tahini and the nutritional yeast. We've got healthy fats. So we've got olive oil in the dressing. We've got coconut oil and milk in the, um, the rice. We've got more fiber than you can shake a fist at with all of our veggies and our chickpeas. And then if you're not vegetarian, feel free to throw some chicken in there, throw some shrimps in there. If you want and you have some tofu, throw some tofu or some tempeh, goat's cheese, cashew cheese, whatever you want to throw in here to fill yourself up, to make it your perfect bowl, that's what you should do. So um, are there any other questions? Pop them in the chat if you've got them. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Oh, might be a little question here. Uh, thank you for this. You're so welcome, Grace. Thank you for coming. So I do want to just say before, <laughs> I don't know, Reen, it must be my genes. Um, it must, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. And if you did enjoy this class and if you are looking for some more inspiration and if you're looking to make some changes in the new year, I am going to be running my Love Your Healthy Self Nutrition Challenge uh, starting next Monday. So if you'd like to check that out, every week I'm going to be offering a cooking class. So, oh, I'll just pop it right into the chat here, everyone. There we go. So every week there's a healthy cooking class. 
going from fermented foods all the way to no bake brownies and Thai curries. You get weekly yoga classes. We get a four week elimination style nutrition program, a great group community, uh, meditation and setting, intention setting sessions, and two live Q and A sessions as well. So that's starting next Monday. It's the Love Your Healthy Self Nutrition Program, not a weight loss program. As I mentioned, I'm all about those healthy, sustainable habits. So that's really what this program is going to do: is help you build some habits, help you help you cook delicious meals. Look at that rainbow, and really connect and build a community because we can't really get together in person right now. So we've got lots of opportunities to come together to cook and chat and do yoga and start our 2021 off on a really great foot. So that link's in the chat if you wanna check it out. If you have any questions, send me an email. I will be putting this recording up tomorrow and sending it out to the list. If you are watching it recorded, I'm sorry if the quality of the video is a little less crisp. For some reason when Zoom records, it doesn't end up as sharp as it is when we're actually live and in person, but you still should be able to get the sense of everything. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much and have a wonderful, lovely evening. Thank you, I'll see you soon.